we're starting today's session with uh, Shiva Razak, who's going to talk to us about high energy neutrinos from astrophysical sources.
uh, this, this flux is, is, uh, covers a wide range of energy, and uh, that means that nature is able to produce this uh, very high energy particles over this wide range. And it also means that when we look for neutrinos uh, produced in astrophysical sources, they can be actually produced uh, essentially the same energy range as the cosmic rays um, are, are, are detected on the Earth. However, the flux of these cosmic rays, they are uh, very small. If you look at the 100 GeV, it's about one particle per meter square per second hitting the Earth. And if you are going about, say, 10 to 15 electron volt, which is uh, uh, one particle per meter square uh, per year. So what it tells us that these cosmic ray fluxes at high energy, especially they are uh, quite low, and uh, the resulting neutrino flux uh, will be also uh, also rather low. And this is a um, better picture of this uh, higher energy range of cosmic rays, and uh, uh, this is a blue out version, so running from. 100 TeV to 10 to the 20th electron volt and above, and there are little bit of features in that spectrum. This is called the knee, uh, the second knee, and the ankle. And uh, one interesting thing is that we actually don't know when these cosmic rays are produced. Uh, there are compelling evidence that these uh, cosmic rays below the knee, uh, below this energy, they are produced most probably in uh, our own galaxy. Uh, from uh, supernova remnants, explosion of massive stars, uh, throwing material out, and there is a relativistic shock that, uh, uh, that flows out from the explosion, and the particles are accelerated in the shock. Uh, so that is the canonical picture to explain this uh, uh, cosmic rays below the knee. And above the knee, it is, uh, it is widely thought that they probably come from extragalactic sources, uh, because there are not enough powerful sources in our own galaxy, uh, to produce these uh, cosmic rays. However, we don't know what uh, the sources are, and the hope is that the neutrinos can tell us what are the sources of these uh, very high energy particles. Uh, so the way uh, the neutrinos are produced at astrophysical sources is very simple. Uh, so you need to have an uh, acceleration of particle at the sources, and this is uh, widely uh, done using uh, collisionless shocks. Uh, when these particles are accelerated by bouncing off uh, some uh, random magnetic field uh, that is produced from some instability in the shock, and these um, particles gain energy, and they interact in the surrounding material either with the gas or with the radiation field through proton-proton interaction or photoelectronic interaction, and they produce lots of pions and kaons, and then uh, these pions decay, so neutral pions decay to gamma rays, and these charged pions decay to uh, muon and electron positron, and also with the, this, uh, with, with the neutrinos. And although these gamma rays, neutron and proton, uh, they may interact farther um, at the source and, uh, uh, and may be lost in the interaction, uh, but these neutrinos, once they're produced, they can directly come from the source, and we can detect them and know whether the particles are accelerated uh, and at astrophysical sources or not. So, uh, so uh, these neutrinos carry essentially uh, the, about 5% of the primary proton energy. And neutrino astronomy is, uh, uh, is, is appealing in, uh, especially because uh, that you have protons and uh, gamma rays uh, produced at astrophysical source, for example, and the protons, they being charged particles, uh, while they're propagating to the Earth, they, they deflect from our line of sight to the source because of the magnetic field. So there are magnetic field in our own galaxy and magnetic field in the intergalactic medium. And uh, these protons or any other charged particles, they deflect in the magnetic field in those directions. So when they're detected on the Earth as cosmic rays, we don't know where they're coming from. Uh, the gamma rays, so of course, uh, uh, the gamma rays produced in the interaction of cosmic rays, uh, they are energetic gamma rays, and up to certain energy, about 100 GeV, up to 100 GeV local universe, we can uh, look at the gamma rays from the sources, but if you are looking at the uh, far, uh, farther out sources, higher chip sources, uh, then these gamma rays, they interact with the uh, starlight or the uh, infrared uh, background in the universe, and they produce different electron pairs and are absorbed, and we cannot detect them uh, directly. So, however, the neutrinos 
uh, they don't um, interact um, uh, much and uh, they can come to us directly. And that's why a very high energy uh, neutrino uh, astronomy uh, can reveal something what uh, these charged particles and uh, gamma rays cannot tell us. Okay, um, so I mentioned this uh, high neutrinos, they can open actually a new window to the universe. We can learn about the universe in a, uh, uh, in a, uh, with the neutrinos. Um, this is the cosmic probe other than the photons. Uh, so, and uh, they can carry information from dense region of astrophysical sources. Um, so, in, in some astrophysical sources, you may have a condition that it's optically thick to photons or gamma rays, uh, but the neutrinos uh, are produced and they can come to us and carry information about this dense environment uh, in astrophysical sources. Um, we can use the, uh, the fundamental interaction at extremely high energy, uh, like uh, uh, interaction of cosmic rays, uh, which uh, at, at an energy which we cannot do or uh, attain at the large hadron collider, um, and uh, also we can look for new kind of interaction uh, with the, uh, w w w at, at very high energy uh, with these neutrinos. Uh, of course, uh, we learn about the astrophysics, uh, uh, the sources of cosmic rays. We learn about the energetics that is required to produce cosmic rays at astrophysical sources. Uh, and we also uh, learn about the nature of the neutrino sources, whether the transient sources uh, produce these cosmic rays and neutrinos, or whether the steady state sources, uh, like a supermassive black hole, uh, uh, they produce these uh, cosmic rays or and neutrinos. And also, in many situations, we have very high energy gamma rays detected from astrophysical sources, like lasers. Um, and uh, it is often ambiguous what is the mechanism to produce these very high energy gamma rays. And of course, uh, one can produce these gamma rays in two ways. One can go to the, uh, in the leptonic path, where electrons are accelerated and they upscatter uh, <coughs> background radiation or surrounding radiation, they come to the scattering and can be detected as gamma rays. Or there could be cosmic rays which interacts with the gas or radiation field and produce pi zero, uh, and, and those pi zero will be uh, detected as uh, gamma rays. Sorry about that. So neutrinos, uh, so, so there's ambiguity between what the mechanism of these very handy cameras and neutrinos can uh, break this dichotomy uh, and, 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 and tell us what is the uh, mechanism to produce uh, these cameras that we detect uh, from uh, astrophysical sources. <coughs> However, the neutrinos that uh, can come from astrophysical sources, they are in the foreground. That, uh, um, that, that we need to understand, and we do understand it but, uh, uh, to some good extent. Uh, so these uh, neutrinos are actually the same cosmic rays coming from the astrophysical sources, but they interact in the atmosphere of the Earth. And when they interact at the, at the, in the atmosphere of the Earth, they again uh, produce this lot of the secondaries so the, through this uh, uh, interaction with the nitrogen molecule or the air molecule. And uh, they produce these piles and chaos, uh, which decays and produce neutrinos. And this produces a foreground uh, of uh, neutrinos that, um, that, 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 uh, um, that, that we need to understand to, uh, to take the astrophysical sources of neutrinos. Uh, and we, we, as I mentioned, we do understand uh, uh, quite reasonably uh, this foreground. So this cosmic ray spectrum is well measured. And uh, this uh, hadronic physics uh, for proton, proton interaction uh, uh, it, it, it is, uh, is quite well known, and uh, there are models uh, to produce this uh, atmospheric uh, neutrino foreground, and uh, uh, they, can they can be compared with data, and uh, these are the data on atmospheric neutrinos uh, from this uh, ice cube neutrino detector, and these are uh, million neutrinos, these are data points up to about 400 TeV, and, and these are uh, electron neutrinos, uh, the flux is much lower because of this um, the neon, um, they, their lifetime is boosted in the atmosphere and they don't decay uh, to produce <coughs> different uh, neutrinos. So their flux is lower. Uh, so these, and these are uh, different models. So shown are uh, two models and uh, uh, the agreement between the data and the model is quite reasonable uh, at, at this stage. So um, the uh, so these are atmospheric neutrinos, and there is another component with atmospheric neutrinos, which is uh, called this prompt atmospheric neutrinos, and uh, 
these are supposed to be uh, created by uh, charm meson decay. So this uh, protons, uh, cosmic rays, they interact and produce this uh, charm meson, and they have very short lifetime and decay, and essentially produce a harder component in the atmospheric neutrino flux. So it hasn't been confirmed yet, uh, but this is at an energy range where we would expect that uh, there would be a, a contribution from cosmic uh, neutrinos uh, in, in this energy range. Uh, could be shown as a hard component. Uh, but before that, let's look at this uh, uh, neutrino telescope, and uh, I'll more specifically talk about the ice cube neutrino telescope. And uh, it is at the geographic south pole. So this is uh, the activity uh, at, at, at the south pole. Um, and uh, at the south pole, there are many uh, telescopes that you are more familiar with uh, the, doing cosmology. Uh, the South Pole Telescope, this bicep, uh, and uh, the Trino Telescope is not in this picture, but they are actually buried underground uh, in ice, as shown at this, uh, as the dots, and each dot corresponds to a hole which is about two and a half kilometer deep, and uh, they're instrumented with the bottom of the tube, and uh, these are the technology used to dig up this, these holes. Um, so they use a, what is called a firm drill, so it's a hot element, and it, uh, uh, it, it digs a hole the first 50 meters, and then hot water is, um, is, is, uh, um, is, is put through these holes, like this, uh, uh, like this uh, hot water uh, cable, and then a two and a half kilometer uh, hole <coughs> is, uh, is drilled with this hot water, and then water is taken out, and uh, instruments are uh, put in this hole through cables with the uh, photo tube. So at the end, it, uh, it's a cartoon of uh, what is under ice, uh, we cannot see, uh, but uh, so this is the ice cube the neutrino detector. It's a uh, kilometer uh, cube instrument of volume, so one gigaton of mass, uh, and it's a pure ice with a very good optical properties. And uh, uh, there are about uh, 86 of these strings and uh, about 60 of uh, these optical modules are uh, 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 form of the tubes uh, per string. And there is a uh, array on the top, it's called the uh, ice top air shard array. Uh, and uh, it has been completed in 2010, so there's about three and a half years of running um, to date. Uh, and this is how an optical module looks like. And this is uh, Eiffel Tower for uh, perspective. And there is a deeper uh, volume inside this uh, ice cube volume, which is called deep core. It has a denser instrumented array so that the energy threshold for neutrino detection can be lowered. For the ice cube, the energy threshold is about 100 GeV, and for the deep core, it's about uh, 10 GeV. There is a counterpart of ice cube in the northern hemisphere, it's in the Mediterranean of the French coast. Uh, it's called the Antares. Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, again, it is about a two and a half kilometer underwater, and, but uh, the size of it is about one tenth of ice cube. But uh, it, it is um, similar detection uh, technology for neutrinos, and how the neutrinos are detected is, is, is shown here. So the neutrinos, they come in and they interact with, uh, with, with, a, uh, with, with the rock or ice, uh, and through this uh, either charge current interaction or neutral current interaction, uh, and especially in case of this neutral current, I'm sorry, the charge current interaction, uh, these neutrinos they can produce these uh, electrons, secondary electrons, which carry uh, most of the energy of the incoming neutrinos. Uh, and this cartoon shows that there's a muon neutrino came in and it interacted here, and then it produced this secondary muon, which carries almost the same energy, about 80% energy of this. Uh, of this primary neutrino, and it's propagating inside ice, and uh, with the speed of, uh, with the speed, greater than the speed of light in ice, and emits Cherenkov radiation, and there are photo multiply tube here, which detects this Cherenkov radiation, and, uh, uh, and, and find out about uh, this uh, existence of this muon uh, coming from neutrino. And these are the different uh, ways to detect these neutrinos. Uh, so, so this is the one uh, I mentioned about just before, this muon neutrinos. 
So this charge kind of interaction produces this muon neutrino, and it uh, uh, looks like a, a, a what 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 is called a line um, of thermal lit up by chain of radiation. And here, this uh, red is the earlier time, and the blue is the later time. So the neutrinos came in uh, this direction. The muon was produced here, and it zoomed through the detector and recording uh, hits in the photomultiplier tube. Um, another, um, uh, uh, another uh, uh, identification is for the uh, electron neutrinos or neutral current um, interaction of neutrinos, where you have this uh, uh, blob of light, which essentially tells that either a, a neutral current event happened or a neutrino just scattered off a nucleic and a previous lot of junk. Uh, and those uh, charged particles, they move in the ice and produce, but they're short-lived, um, and, and uh, uh, they produce the ball of light in the detector, or if the uh, electron neutrino produce an electron, or a tau neutrino produce a tau, and those then interact further in the, in, in the ice and uh, produce the, this uh, large secondary uh, cascade or shower, and those emit this chain of radiation and looks like a, like a ball um, in the detector. Uh, especially for the charge uh, current tau neutrino events, uh, you produce a tau and, uh, uh, and then tau can uh, decay and uh, produce a, uh, another ball of light. So in this scenario, uh, from this geometry, you can identify the tau neutrino events. So that initially, there's an interaction here, uh, charge current interaction, and then produce the tau, and the tau decays. Uh, and then they produce a secondary uh, a blob here, and this is what is called a double band uh, signature of tau neutrino. And this works at very high energy, about 1 PeV. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so this, this is um, so in, in this three way, one can uh, have some handle on the flavor identification of the uh, neutrinos uh, by this, by the uh, by ice cube. Okay, uh, now. Uh, now, ASCIF has recently discovered neutrinos that is uh, most likely coming from uh, outside the Earth. They are not atmospheric program. Uh, most probably they are coming from astrophysical sources. And these are the three events, the, most high, the, high, the highest energy events shown here. So the first one was detected in August 2011. It's at 1.1 PeV, it's called So this tells us that uh, people, um, even when they grew up, they cannot forget their childhood memory, and they name these things after their favorite uh, cartoon characters. Uh, um, and, and then this is the bird, and then this is the highest energy event so far. It's two PEVs, the big bird, and then uh, this is the one PEV event. It's the, it's the early system state um, character. However, uh, however you name them, um, so uh, this is the, the first time uh, there are evidence that high energy neutrinos coming from uh, outside the Earth, most probably from astrophysical uh, sources. So, uh, this is a uh, distribution of events uh, in ice cube uh, from 1 TeV to uh, 2 PeV. And this is for the southern sky and this is for northern sky. So, ice cube can detect neutrinos coming from above or below. Uh, and uh, and in, in case of southern sky, uh, there are, is a high rate of atmospheric muons, so they are produced from cosmic ray interaction in the atmosphere. And you can see that this rate is the atmospheric muon, which is actually has a six order magnitude higher flux than the atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, however, they have a veto technology uh, in ice cube, so they can reject this, most of this uh, muon, but it's not um, complete. So there, is, there are muon leaking through the detector coming from atmosphere, and there is an atmospheric neutrinos, and these are the data points that we measure um, uh, in, in the detector. And you can see that uh, these are the uh, uh, expected uh, events, and the uh, detected events that exceed uh, from expectation of uh, atmospheric neutrino program. And in the same for the northern skies, the neutrinos coming from down to the detector, and in this case, uh, the muons, there are muon flux coming from below, they actually range out in ice or in, in, in the earth, and they don't come to the detector. So there, there is uh, almost zero background of muon, but of course neutrinos coming from below, 
uh, the gap to the detector and is dominated by um, this uh, atmospheric neutrinos. And again, uh, there is an enhancement of uh, events uh, expected uh, over the atmospheric, uh, atmospheric neutrinos. And this is um, another uh, picture. It's uh, uh, all three flavors of these neutrinos. Um, and, and this is a combined north and south um, energy distribution of these neutrino events, about uh, 30 GTB. Um, so there are total 37 events detected above 30 GTB. Uh, and uh, from the atmospheric neutrinos and beyond background, our foreground, uh, we expect about 8.4 uh, plus minus 4.2 events from beyond and atmospheric neutrinos 6.6 uh, plus minus 5.9. Uh, 1.6, and, and, and this clearly shows that uh, these neutrinos they are they have a different source than these uh, uh, atmospheric neutrinos and muon. And this is about a 5.7 sigma rejection um, that these uh, neutrinos are coming from um, the atmosphere. So this is a discovery of a component in the neutrino flux, uh, most probably coming from um, outside. Um, outside the Earth. Uh, so if we look at the, uh, plot, the flux of these neutrinos, so this is an atmospheric neutrino flux, and then there is this um, neutrinos probably coming from astrophysical sources or cosmic sources outside the Earth, and they give this hard component in, in, in the flux. Um, so so the, they need to be hard component, uh, especially um, to, to be detected about the atmospheric background. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this is the uh, atmospheric uh, cosmic uh, neutrino um, measured by ice cube. Uh, this is a map of um, neutrinos detected by ice cube. Um, and at this energy, about uh, uh, around 1 PeV, uh, ice cube still cannot uh, distinguish between tau neutrino and uh, uh, electron neutrino. So, then uh, they, they show these uh, events in, in, uh, in terms of cracks, which would be most likely uh, muon neutrino, and showers, which would be most likely electron neutrino and tau neutrino. And you can see that there are um, events uh, distributed in the equatorial coordinate system. The plus signs are for the cascades, uh, the showers, electron and tau neutrino, or neutral current neutrino, neutral current events. And uh, these X are um, the, the muon neutrinos. Uh, and the angular resolution, uh, the, um, the accuracy of um, uh, reconstructing the direction of the neutrinos uh, is about 50 degrees for cascades and 1 degree for tracks. Uh, so, so the muons uh, neutrinos, they have a very good angular resolution uh, compared to many uh, gamma ray uh, detectors. And uh, uh, this plot um, shows that um, th th they are kind of uh, scattered randomly in the sky, however, uh, there is a hint of uh, clustering near the galactic center, although at this point, uh, this is statistically not that much significant yet, uh, but uh, hopefully in, in future, uh, when uh, increased deficit, <coughs> there can be um, more said about, the, uh, uh, about uh, the interesting direction in the sky. And, and so far, there's no correlation with any of these extragalactic or galactic point sources that we know. Okay, um, so with, with the uh, ice cube neutrino events detected, then there are a few um, uh, puzzling uh, questions um, about, about them. So the first is that there are too few events with direction from northern hemisphere. So if you look at the previous picture, uh, this kind of so you see that uh, there are fewer events in this half uh, 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 compared, to, compared to this half. So there are about nine upcoming events coming from below uh, to the detector and 28 downwind events. And the expected ratio is about, uh, uh, about half uh, for this uh, uh, upcoming uh, to downgoing event. And this is because at the, at the at high energy, the neutrinos they interact inside the Earth, especially if they are going to a, uh, a, a long distance to the Earth, there is a possibility that they can be observed uh, in the Earth and uh, the flux will be reduced. Uh, so, but that's an energy-dependent um, quantity, 
and one would expect about a half uh, reduction of these events uh, from this upcoming to downwind, but the reduction here is, is uh, much, uh, much more severe uh, than one ex expects. Whether it's the property of the detector, maybe, or uh, maybe not, but uh, still needs to be uh, addressed. And there are fewer tracked events um, at low energy. So there's seven uh, or less uh, of these track events. So if you saw this um, ice cube, uh, a sky map, so there are about seven of these track events. And we actually expect uh, uh, that some of these track events are actually uh, atmospheric muons rather than neutrinos. So if we subtract then this atmospheric muon, expected atmospheric number of muons, the number of track events will be much smaller than seven. And that is uh, in contradiction of what we know about uh, the flux of um, neutrinos. So the what we know is that uh, the neutrinos, they oscillate between the flavors, the mass eigenstates and the flavor eigenstates are not uh, um, the same. So the neutrinos produced at, as one flavor, they can be detected as another flavor after the propagation. And uh, this, uh, for astrophysical sources, <coughs> Uh, this uh, probability is just uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, mixing uh, matrix square uh, where u is this uh, PMNS of the quantifiable uh, uh, Marki Nakagawa Sakata um, uh, uh, mixing matrix. And if we have a source which produces neutrinos at 1, 2, 0 flavor, so electron neutrino 1 neutrinos, we have 2 mu neutrinos and 0 tau neutrinos, which is expected from um, charge pions or k on decay, then we will expect that after this oscillation uh, on the Earth there will be 1 1 1 ratio of this electron <coughs> muon and tau neutrino. And uh, this few track events seems to uh, uh, contradict that expectation, um, but there could be again uh, some detector properties uh, affecting this and, and, and we don't know. Uh, and another issue is about the uh, the cosmic ray energy required to produce this uh, very high energy neutrino, especially at 1 PeV. Uh, so to produce 1 PeV neutrino by a proton, you need about 10 PeV proton to produce them. And if you produce uh, 1 PeV neutrino with the uh, interaction of nuclei, then this uh, 10, it will be 10 PeV times the, uh, the Z, the atomic um, uh, 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 the mass uh, number of the, of the nuclei. Uh, and what we know from measurement of uh, cosmic rays on the Earth that uh, uh, this uh, uh, 10 PV, uh, at 10 PV and 30 PV, uh, the observed cosmic rays are mostly actually iron. Okay, so that that's a that's a puzzle. Um, and and if they are mostly iron, then the expected neutrino flux is uh, quite small. Uh, okay, so regardless of this puzzle. Um, that we have detected these neutrinos, and let's search for what kind of astrophysical sources can produce these neutrinos. And in this regard, I will um, um, appeal to conventional astronomy or the gamma ray astronomy. Okay, so the, the gamma ray astronomy is quite helpful here because the gamma rays are non-thermal and uh, they are can be produced at the same sources where particles are accelerated and hopefully produce neutrinos. And uh, the currently uh, the largest uh, um, or the most uh, um, uh, useful uh, all-sky gamma ray telescope is uh, what's called the Fermi, of which I'm a member. Um, and uh, this is the pair conversion telescope in the sky uh, or uh, in a, in a uh, in satellite. And incoming gamma rays are produced uh, are, are detected with uh, uh, this conversion of two electron positron pairs, and it is sent into 20 MeV to over 300 GeV. Range. So after five years of observation, uh, this is a sky map of gamma rays, about 100 MeV, uh, and you can see that uh, uh, like this characteristic features of gamma rays, which can be uh, can can be shown as uh, the combination of the uh, sources in our galaxy, uh, the point sources. This is the galaxy's diffusion emission, the point sources, and extragalactic isotropic component, and who knows, hopefully, maybe dark matter uh, component um, in this. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a slide showing all the discoveries made by Fermi um, and the uh, detection uh, over this, uh, this five-year or five-year uh, period. 
And this list includes from local sources such as uh, terrestrial gamma ray flares, uh, galactic sources such as pulsars, uh, Novi, this is kind of new source, uh, supernova remnant, uh, the Fermi bubble in our galaxy, uh, and the uh, starburst galaxies, and as we go in distance, then there are blazers and the gamma ray bursts. And, and this is the um, uh, uh, publicly available recent catalog, the second Fermi large area telescope catalog. It contains 1873 sources, and there's all varieties of sources uh, that, that are listed here. I'll not go into details, um, but uh, there are about 10 source classes now in gamma rays. Uh, there are known source classes like ADN, pulsars, pulsar nebula, supernova remnant, and there are new sources like Novi. Uh, uh, millisecond pulsars, starburst galaxies, and there are about, about 30 percent uh, of these sources are unidentified. Okay, uh, now for the origin of these ice cube neutrinos, at least uh, some of it, uh, I, I would uh, uh, look to these uh, uh, these farming bubbles at the galactic center. Okay, so they're, they're uh, discovered by Finn Bainer and all of the Fermi lab data. And they coincident with uh, this WMAP 23 gigahertz and the rows of X-ray data. Um, and, and these are um, kind of see that this, these are a uh, giant structure at the galactic center. It's a map uh, in 1 to 10 GeV energy. And this is uh, the map about 10 GeV. And in this case, there is no uh, the subtraction, background subtraction used here. And you just see that this, there's some kind of structure here, and these are um, so this Fermi bubble is a cartoon of these bubbles, and there's a one on the top and the one on the bottom, and uh, uh, they, they, these are uh, uh, to be uh, these are measured to be uh, uniformly um, uh, uniformly bright in cameras over this whole bubble surface. Okay, but the, uh, the north bubble and, and the south bubble there in the galactic center, and we are around. 8.8 and a half kilo per sec um, from the galactic center, and, and these are huge. They have a radius about four and a half kilo per sec. Okay, uh, now um, the formation of this bubble, how they are formed, okay, uh, is still um, uh, debatable, unknown. Uh, but uh, uh, the the ideas include like activity of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Uh, which is uh, uh, dormant, uh, or it has a very low luminosity uh, at the present, but there could be a time in the past when it was active and produced a lot of accretion and uh, outflow uh, from the galactic uh, uh, center black hole, and the, that uh, outflow produced this uh, bubble um, uh, um, above, and, above and below the galactic uh, plane, or there could be a situation with a high rate of star formation activity at the galactic center. So it is evident from infrared data uh, near the galactic center, which means that a lot of stars are forming and a lot of supernova uh, activity going on. And these supernova remnants, they uh, march together and produce some sort of outflow uh, from the, uh, above and below the plane and which inflate this bubble. And the cosmic rays are accelerated in the supernova remnants and they are carried with the wind to fill up this bubble volume and while they are in the bubble volume, they interact with the gas and produce uh, pines, into <coughs> pine, and they decay to produce gamma ray. So this is a, uh, the picture that I will adopt. And in this picture, you also uh, produce neutrinos because these gamma rays are produced from neutral pine decay. So and you have charged pine, and this charged pine will decay and produce neutrinos. And this is sort of uh, uh, the gamma ray data and the hydronic model that we have used to fit this camera data and uh, predict the uh, neutrino flux uh, back in 2012 before uh, ice cube data was uh, ice cube data was made public before the discovery of neutrinos but after uh, the discovery of ice cube neutrinos so we look at the uh, neutrino direction in the sky and you can see that this is the in, uh, galactic uh, galactic coordinate system and these are the ice cube events cascades and uh, tracks and these are the contours of the Fermi bubble and it's better uh, that uh, uh, some quite significant number of events are uh, specially correlated uh, with, with, the, with the Fermi um, bubble. Especially, um, there could be five shower-like events and three track-like uh, events correlated with the bubble. 
Uh, and then we looked further, and uh, this is the, uh, the direction of the other uh, position coordinates of the events and the bubbles in the equatorial coordinate system. And uh, we, we found that there are four strongly correlated events with their central value within the bubble and four weakly correlated uh, events with their, uh, within, the, uh, within their error bar uh, of the Fermi bubble. And this is the event uh, distribution, the expected number of uh, uh, neutrino events coming from the Fermi bubble in the hadronic model. Uh, so these are the uh, event distribution, the actual event uh, seen by ice cube, and these are the expected uh, number of events depending on different uh, maximum energy of the cosmic ray uh, in, in the in the in the Fermi bubble. Okay, so there, there there is seems to be some something there. So there uh, could be some uh, hint there that uh, maybe the same process which makes these cameras uh, from the Fermi bubble they also produce these neutrinos and they are correlated. Uh, and, and some of these neutrino events um, can be explained with, the, uh, with, with this scenario. But of course, we can't explain all the neutrino events taken by ice cube uh, because there are events coming from higher um, um, galactic latitude. That means they are most probably coming from extragalactic sources. Okay? And in that case, there, there are scenarios where uh, these cosmic rays can be excited at the extragalactic sources, um, and, and uh, then you produce these uh, neutrinos uh, from interaction. And this is sort of a cartoon. Uh, people usually, usually show, show in the field. It's called the Hillis diagram, and it shows this uh, size scale of the source where the particles are excited, and the magnetic field uh, in, in the source. And these are the lines which gives the uh, equal energy, maximum cosmic ray energy uh, for different kinds of sources. And, and, and there are sources like supernova and supernova neutrinos, not in our galaxy, but in the outside galaxies, uh, especially in the star wars galaxies, which can produce these neutrinos. Uh, and uh, this is the shock from the supernova that uh, accelerates particles, and, and these particles can interact and produce neutrinos. And this uh, has been shown by Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope that uh, there is evidence of this uh, particle acceleration in, in supernova shocks. And uh, this is an expected neutrino signal from the star galaxies, galaxies outside our galaxies, which has high star formation activity. And there could be gamma ray bursts, and a lot of uh, uh, interest in this gamma ray burst because they are very energetic explosion in the universe, and they are probably related to the supernova um, and, and the long duration GRBs they are related. And I'll not go into details much, but uh, there are different scenarios where uh, neutrinos can be produced in this. Uh, uh, very, uh, very energetic explosions. And there are supermassive black holes, the blazers, and ADNs. Uh, they, are, um, they, they are gamma ray sources and very energy gamma ray sources, and they can uh, produce neutrinos uh, through this hydraulic channel. And uh, these are uh, some, uh, some scenario where this ice cube data, this one point here, is fitted by uh, uh, these uh, neutrinos from these ADNs. Okay, so 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 I think that the uh, discovery of ice cube um, is, uh, is 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 very interesting, and this is probably the first glimpse of uh, a, a, a cosmic messenger other than the photon that we can use to learn uh, about the astrophysical sources. <coughs> and uh, there, uh, uh, in my personal view, is that uh, this uh, this ice cube between events they are most probably. Uh, coming from both the galactic and extragalactic sources, and for the galactic sources there is hints that uh, they may be coming from the Fermi bubbles, uh, but, uh, but of course we also need uh, extragalactic sources because we can explain all the sources, uh, all the events. Uh, anyway, uh, so these are the uh, conclusions. Uh, in short, um, detection of these events is uh, or the birth of a uh, new uh, uh, field uh, of astronomy with a high energy neutrinos. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? If you show that the ice cube data, um, you have to subtract the photon, you said that it's always a point larger than the same For this high energy event, this 37, what is the next effect on the Yes, uh, there are backgrounds uh, coming from both atmospheric neutrinos and atmospheric muons. 
So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so among the 37 events, uh, about six of them are from atmospheric uh, neon uh, background, and uh, about uh, uh, about another six from atmospheric neutrinos. But uh, so the, the total number of events is, is much larger than what is expected from the background. So yes, yeah, so so the ICP uses a little system uh, to reduce this background. So if there is a uh, for example, neutrinos coming from above, okay, um, then, uh, or a neon coming from above, then it can detect this neon with the outer layer of the detector and video this as a, not, a, uh, uh, not, not a neutrino event. So, uh, and, and neutrinos coming from below, it is, it is basically background free of neon, neon background free because the neons are absorbed uh, while, while passing through the Earth. So it's mostly for the neutrinos coming from above, which has this contamination uh, with, with atmospheric uh, neutrinos and uh, with, with atmospheric neon background. And let's thank the speaker again. Size of atoms. Actually, this shrinking size of atoms 
since there was a discussion on Hoyle, uh, this uh, the general idea is not new. What I will present you today is, of course, not a different model of cosmology as Hoyle was proposing one. I'm just proposing a different picture of cosmology, which has actually the same predictions as the usual Big Bang cosmology, except for a few uh, uh, exceptions. So then, the point I want to make it from the beginning. Uh, it's not a completely new model of cosmology. It's a different way of looking at the same physics. Uh, and uh, it's just having different pictures of one and the same uh, physical content. And of course, they look very strange at the beginning. But then if you concentrate on physical measurable quantities, like for example this ratio of distance between galaxies divided by uh, the atom size, uh, if you concentrate on these, then the two pictures will give the same answer. For the theorists, uh, there is an exact map between the two pictures. While scaling or conformal scaling. So I can be sure really, just from mathematics, that in all these pictures the predictions will be, set, will be the same. Huh? So of course I can compute in every picture, but just to, you know, to give you a, a certain feeling uh, why at the end this is not so surprising that everything comes out right, I can just map that to a more standard picture and I will give that to you at the end. So once you have several pictures, then of course the question is simply which one is useful. And I want to convince you that the picture of uh, the increasing masses and the increasing Planck scale is actually quite useful for understanding many features of cosmology, in particular the issue if there was a singularity at the Big Bang or not. So the central ingredient for all these cosmologies are scale field. Why do you need that? Well, if you want to have your particle masses change in time, uh, one field theory tells you you need a field that changes its value in time. Just as the, as the Higgs field, if the Higgs field changes its value, the particle masses of the electron mass, for example, changes its value. So here we have a more general Higgs mechanism, if you want. Uh, I call this field the cosmon at the time. So all particle masses are proportional to this cosmon field, and if the cosmon field value changes, or for example, increases, as it will do, then the particle uh, masses will increase and the atom size will shrink. So this scalar field plays a crucial role in cosmology and actually it had already in a certain sense its merits. Uh, this was a scalar field I used in uh, 87 when I introduced uh, uh, quintessence. Um, actually you may ask why did I put this slide with a, uh, with a reference, uh, of course, uh, would be nice if you cite occasionally original work and not only uh, references. I admit that is part of the motivation. I think that's human. You do not want your work to be forgotten. But the real motivation is a different one. The real motivation is when I uh, discussed these things in talks at the time, the reaction was always, well, it's interesting. It's not obviously wrong, but let him just do. Uh, why should we worry about it? And it's a bit this type of attitude I feel uh, for many talks on the subject I want to present you today. People say, yeah, it's not obviously wrong, but let him do. And I just want to motivate you that uh, it is perhaps useful to put a little uh, intellectual energy on it. After all, cosmologists should have a, their own opinion if the universe uh, has a singularity or if the universe is eternal, after all these other questions that we are always asked by the public. So at the time, of course, the prediction was not perfect. It was a prediction that there should be homogeneous dark energy of the same order as dark matter. Uh, it was a real prediction, not just hand waving, motor, compute, wave field equation, solve it. Uh, but it did not uh, match all the present observations, and I will tell you a, a simple modification for late cosmology having to do with the way how neutrino masses depend on the scalar field that solves these discrepancies and makes really a, a 
model that is compatible with all the observations. One of the nice features of these scalar field models is that they can be used not only for late dark energy, dynamical dark energy, but also for inflation. You actually have the same field, the same simple effective action with field equations that describes both inflation and uh, late dark energy, and I often call that Cosmon inflation. <coughs> we will come to that. The point I want to get to here is something that you're perhaps not so much familiar with, but uh, I want to talk about the important ingredient that such a scalar field may be for our understanding of quantum gravity. Uh, so this is a very basic motivation, and uh, I have also a little cartoon how I imagine quantum gravity to work, so it's a full quantum field series of gravity as the metric and the scalar field as the ingredients. And uh, the way how it should work is actually that there are two fixed points. One fixed point is an ultraviolet fixed point. This is necessary if you want a quantum field theory of gravity to be a consistent, renormalizable theory. It will not be perturbatively renormalizable, but if there is a fixed point, it will be non-perturbatively renormalizable. And I will advocate that there is a second fixed point, now an infrared fixed point, now uh, uh, going for intrinsic mass scales to zero or intrinsic length scales to infinity. And since we have a quantum theory, your theory is of course not scale invariant, or as a whole it will be scale invariant at the ultraviolet and at the infrared fixed point. But in between, there will be a crossover. And cosmology actually will exactly map this crossover. We will see that the vicinity of the ultraviolet fixed point, this is inflation. Then there's a first stage of crossover. This is the end of inflation. Then there's again a very slow flow near what you may call an approximate standard model fixed point that will describe radiation and matter domination. And then there's a second crossover triggered in the beyond standard model sector, first visible in the neutrinos, and this triggers the onset of dark energy and uh, the final transition to the infrared fixed point. Now, do we have evidence of this picture? Well, in a certain sense, uh, you could say yes, uh, because one of the most crucial ingredients is if you have a fixed point in the quantum field theory, then you have scale invariance. If you're sitting exactly at the first point, then scale invariance is exact. Now, since we are making a crossover from one fixed point to another, we have two situations where scale invariance is a very good approximation. The one is near the ultraviolet fixed point. Do we see something like scale invariance? Yes, the scale invariant fluctuation spectrum of primordial fluctuation. The scale invariance of this spectrum comes exactly in this model from the approximate scale invariance near this fixed point. So a very simple explanation of this case. The second is, have we uh, some possibility of uh, seeing scale invariance for near this infrared fixed point? Well, there is a difference between these two fixed points. At the ultraviolet fixed point, scale invariance is an exact symmetry and it is not spontaneously broken. So all particles will be massless at the fixed point. At the other fixed point, scale invariance is still an exact symmetry, but it is spontaneously broken by a non-zero value of the scalar field. So all particles are massive. Uh, so that is, of course, what we observe. That's where the masses of particles come from. But since it's a global symmetry that is spontaneously broken, at the fixed point you will have a massless Goldstone boson. And near the fixed point you will find an almost massless pseudo Goldstone boson, and that's a cosmos. That's the dynamical scalar field of quintessence. And this is actually the reason why uh, this field is almost massless, and if you hear sometimes talk saying that these things are unnatural because quantum fluctuation always introduces masses. This is just nonsense. If you have a symmetry, then you have massless Goldstone bosons, and if you have almost an exact symmetry, then you have almost massless particles. It's as simple as that. 
And that is, of course, one of the prime candidates for dynamical dark energy. So these were words. Now, uh, let me also give you a formula. Actually, you can formulate these ideas in a very, very simple way. Now, you just have the theory of gravity coupled to a scalar field. I've written down here the quantum effective action. And it's very simple. So, you mentioned quantum fluctuations are solved. We have been able, let's say, by functional renormalization to solve uh, the quantum gravity properly and we get an effective action from which we can then derive field equations and solve them and get cosmology. So how does it look like? It's very simple. You have instead of the Planck mass, you have this scalar field. So this is, dy this is, this is dynamic. And you have a very simple potential and that is where the intrinsic mass scale mu appears. We need an intrinsic mass scale if we want to describe a crossover between two fixed points because without an intrinsic mass scale everything would be exactly scale invariant. So the intrinsic mass scale is simply the mass term of this Boltzmann field. And then we have a kinetic term that is now multiplied <coughs> by a function that I, you may call a kinesia, that's a dimensionless function depends on chi over the intrinsic mass scale. For B equals 6, we have the conformal the theory, so that is also the bound where things get unstable, so we need a positive B. And so we have just one free function in this whole theory, which is this function B. And that will describe the process. So very minimal information. Actually, you may ask, why do I choose exactly a quadratic potential? Well, by field redefinitions, you can, except for a few particular cases, you can reformulate all uh, these scalar tensor series in this form with a standard coupling to gravity and with a standard potential, and then the information is in the kinetic term. Uh, so that is, uh, that is always doable, and it makes the discussion here particularly simple. Of course, you could redo that and transform it into other quantities if you want. Now, there is a flow, and the flow is now given by the flow equation how this dimension, this quantity, depends on the intrinsic scale. So that's a renormalization group equation as you have it for the gauge coupling if you want. Huh? And I have here a simple assumption that it's quadratic for small b, and uh, it increases uh, and it's linear. Uh, for uh, large b. That's all that I need. How it makes an exact transition is actually not important. So that's an assumption. That's the assumption that I have uh, that I need. Uh, and from this very simple assumption, from this very simple limiting behavior, you get uh, a realistic cosmology. Of course, you need the particle physics sector how particle masses depend on chi, but except neutrinos, all particles' masses will be proportional to chi. So, that's of course an example of a variable gravity theory. The scalar field couples to gravity, the effective Planck mass, oops, the effective Planck mass depends on gravity. This will be an important ingredient. So it has a very simple uh, scalar potential. Nucleon and electron masses are proportional to the dynamical Planck mass. This actually ensures also that all the observational bounds uh, on time varying couplings uh, are obeyed. Uh, you test always scalar ratio or mass ratio, so they are invariant. And only the neutrino mass will be different from uh, the high dependence of the neutrino mass will be different. We have another uh, pointer because this one is still pretty heavy. Any of that we go on. So, uh, just to come very quickly to the uh, infrared fixed point and the ultraviolet fixed point, they are pretty easy to understand. Uh, oops, that was missing. Right, so, before I go, let me just do parameter counting. Uh, so we had two parameters in this function b, and now we have one intrinsic mass scale. An intrinsic mass scale is actually never measurable. It sets your units uh, in a certain sense. And uh, I've set units such that the present value of the scalar field chi 
is equal to the Planck mass, and in these units, this only mass scale has a size of 2 times 10 to the power minus 3 electron volt. Uh, so, uh, or the inverse of it is 10 to 10 here. That will be actually the only, it will be actually the only mass scale in this theory. This is pretty important. Because there will be not a tiny ratio between two mass scales like the chronological constant over Planck scale. The Planck mass is dynamical, it just changes, it just grows and grows and grows. And there's only one mass scale. And if you have only one mass scale, you get rid immediately of, uh, the, fi of the tuning problems for the cosmological constant. We will see the, uh, the field equations of this will just be of the type that the Planck mass increases, increases, increases compared to this mass scale mu. And uh, as a result of that, uh, today's uh, dark energy is very small without that you ever need any tuning. Huh? So only one mass scale, no explicit Planck scale. Now to the two fixed points that we can do quickly. Well, the infrared one where the mass, the intrinsic mass scale goes to zero is very simple. This part drops out. This part here goes to a constant, actually to zero. So obviously there is no scale, it's scale symmetric, it has actually even conformal symmetry. The ultraviolet fixed point is a little bit more tricky, not much more tricky. Now we have this kinesial diverging with a certain power of one of chi. So when the infrared uh, fixed point, uh, then uh, this kinesial diverges. So you would say, well, then we still have a mass scale because we have this scale mu that goes to infinity, and here we have a mass scale where is scale symmetry. But actually, you find that scale symmetry is realized, but with an anomalous dimension. The scalar field does not scale with a canonical dimension, but with an anomalous dimension. And that is pretty easy to understand once you just use a renormalized scalar field. You just bring the kinetic term to standard form, then it's just d mu chi r, d mu chi r. I've actually added for the ultraviolet fixed point also the dimensionless higher order curvature invariant. And that's the only thing that survives at this fixed point. Because if you compute the term that is proportional to the curvature scalar or proportional to the potential, uh, and you express it in the terms of the renormalized scalar field, these terms actually go to zero when mu goes to infinity. So it's just a different realization of scale symmetry with an anomalous dimension. This fixed point is crucial for quantum gravity. If it exists, all the old ideas of Weinberg on asymptotic safety are realized. And there's a lot of work on functional renormalization pioneered by Martin Reuter. Uh, showing quite a lot of evidence that such a ultraviolet fixed point in quantum in uh, gravity really exists. So, and once you have it, then you have scale symmetry. Uh, I put that once more here because many people tell, well, you always argue about scale symmetry, but we know that quantum fluctuations violate scale symmetry. Oh, quantum fluctuations violate scale symmetry. Even if you start with a classical action that is completely scale invariant, quantum fluctuations will violate scale symmetry. But quantum fluctuations are responsible for flowing couplings, for running couplings. And if there are fixed points, at the fixed points, you produce scale symmetry. So quantum fluctuations, of course, tell you that your whole theory is not scale symmetric, but it becomes scale symmetric at fixed points. And this is exactly what happens in this type of cosmologies. You have at the fixed points exact scale symmetry induced by quantum fluctuations, not destroyed by quantum fluctuations. Now the crossover between the fixed point that I told you already is encoded in this function B, and I've chosen it. Uh, it's not really important such that I can write an easy analytic solution to it uh, just to do, cross, uh, to do uh, calculations. And that's it. Now we can just uh, uh, plot it in, compute what happens, and see what, this, what the cosmology is doing. Before I give you the cosmological results, uh, let me make a few comments. 
The first is that this type of cosmology that will describe both inflation and dark energy is very deeply linked to the basic origin of mass uh, in particle physics. Uh, masses can arise either by spontaneous scraping of the rotation symmetry, this is the part when they are proportional to chi, or they can be due to explicit scale symmetry. These are masses proportional to mu. In principle, does both play a role. At the fixed points, mu does not play a role. Uh, so if chi is zero, particle masses are zero. If chi is different from zero at the infrared fixed point, particle masses are non-zero. Uh, and in between, for the end of inflation, for example, the explicit mass <coughs> is actually important and determines how inflation ends. So how you get actually this translation from the quantum gravity properties, the, the, the dependence on an intrinsic mass scale u, renormalization scale if you want, how do you get this translation from here to the properties of cosmology? Well, it's very simple. Since we have a dimension less function, b, it can only depend on the ratio between chi and mu. So you can see the ultraviolet fixed point either as mu going to infinity or as chi going to zero. And the infrared one either as mu going to zero or chi going to infinity. And now cosmology, if you just solve the field equations, they will lead to a variation of this field, of this field chi. This field chi will be zero in the infinite past and uh, grow to infinity in the infinite future. And simply by this evolution of chi, you can map by the cosmological evolution all the flow e uh, evolution in quantum gravity. So cosmology really flows from this ultraviolet fixed point in the infinite past to the infrared fixed point in the infinite future. It's a pretty simple picture. So, it's simple not only because we have a simple concept. Inflation is now not just coming there ad hoc because it's now linked to the ultraviolet fixed point. But in addition also, you know, the calculations are very simple. <coughs> After all, it's a very simple model uh, and it, it will account for inflation, early dark energy, and the present dark energy dominated epoch. And I will, without going into detail yet, already tell you that this model is compatible with all observations. It has no more free parameters than lambda CDM, but just this simple function B here, together with one parameter that enters in, uh, uh, that gives the quantitatively how strongly the neutrino masses grow at present, this is enough to give you a realistic cosmology. How does it look? Well, it looks strange. I give you this picture. Inflation, universe expands, radiation and matter, universe shrinks, dark energy, universe expands. Well, this comes just out of uh, these equations and you of course, uh, you know, when you see it first, you think a little bit, well, when the universe shrinks, when the universe was much colder in the past, uh, how will it ever produce uh, uh, nuclear synthesis or the CMB? The answer is again very simple. Well, it is true that the temperature in this model was uh, smaller than today in the past. Uh, the temperature grows with the square root of chi, so it was much smaller in the past than today. The universe was really cold, or I call it sometimes a freeze picture. Uh, much colder than the present microwave background. <coughs> but the particle masses increase, and actually if you compute the measurable quantity, which is, which is the ratio temperature over particle mass, this decreases like, chi, like 1 over square root of chi. And this is what counts. So you get just the same physics of the hot plasma. Uh, you get nuclear synthesis. You get CFD uh, emission as in cosmology. There will be only very tiny modifications due to 
early dark energy, but the overall picture is just the same. Again, we are never be, we are never able to measure temperature absolutely. The only thing we always measure are ratios, dimensionless ratios, as temperature over the plant mass. Now let's go first to inflation. Uh, Actually, this universe, as you have seen it perhaps on the picture, has no big bang. You can extend it to infinity, and you can solve it explicitly. I give you here the explicit solution for uh, one particular value of this uh, anomalous uh, dimension. So you get field equations, you solve them, and the asymptotic solution is actually that h is a constant, so that is an exponential expansion. But even at these early times, uh, the time scale is 10 to the 10 years. The time scale is not 10 to the minus 40 seconds. The time scale is 10 to the 10 years. And the scalar field goes with the power of time to zero if time goes to minus infinity. So, simple solution. Uh, and it has a uh, striking consequence. The universe is in total. Uh, you can really continue that to minus infinite time. Of course, here it is time in some particular coordinate system. You have to work out now what happens with physical time, you know, how often it makes, uh, clock makes duck, 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 duck. You count and indeed uh, the number of oscillations goes to infinity when time goes to minus infinity. So in physical time, the universe is this type of solution is really an eternal universe. Actually, I can give you still other frames where uh, in the past the universe is even just flat. Huh? So uh, just Minkowski space uh, and the uh, scalar field goes to zero with a different ray. There is, of course, there are of course not only two pictures, but once you have understood how to map between different pictures, I can give you a third one where the universe would even be flat in the past. So that's perhaps one of the most important lessons there is no Big Bang singularity. The Big Bang singularity comes only when you make a singular transformation to the Einstein frame, and we may discuss a little bit more in detail uh, uh, in the discussion if you want how this, uh, what is the role of this singularity. Second, the universe is always very slow. There's only one mass scale, 10 to 10 here. That's the mass scale for radiation domination, that's the mass scale for inflation, it never goes faster. Uh, so it's in a certain sense a pretty boring universe uh, because you know you go back and uh, it's just the particle masses go very slowly to zero. Uh, Hubble parameters always 10 to 10 years. Uh, uh, not very dramatic. Uh, I can't help that is what comes out. Uh. So now is it realistic? Well, you can compute. You can compute density fluctuations, of course, in this uh, model. You can compute uh, the tens of the scalar ratio. You find that uh, the spectral index is typically something like 0 0.96. I have plotted it here in the range of sigma from 1 to 2, which is the one where the fixed point exists. Uh, so that is a range that is very well compatible with measurement. And it gives a somewhat large tensor ratio. Uh, so uh, that may be uh, disputable. Of course, if bicep would be right, this would be exactly uh, the tensor ratio you would get. But actually, uh, since I like this model, I even made a bet with Luca Mendola that uh, the bicep result is right, even though I was convinced that you cannot really trust bicep. Huh? That's uh, a completely different question. But the simplest model is just give you a large tensor ratio. Now you can also compute the amplitude of uh, primordial uh, fluctuations. Um, okay, that was just the first little comment. So the, one of the parameters we have in this model, this anomalous dimension sigma, this is directly determining both the spectral index and the tensor uh, fluctuations. Now the amplitude of tensor fluctuations is again, uh, is again a very simple explanation. When you are close to a fixed point, it depends how close you are in a certain sense. Uh, just for any renormalization group flow, if you're very close, you stay eternally close to the fixed point. At some moment, you will deviate from a fixed point, and this sets a scale. 
And this scale may be, this is of running is logarithmic, may be larger, actually, for example, three or four orders larger <coughs> than the intrinsic scale mu. And this is exactly what gives you the amplitude of primordial density fluctuation. It is given by the scale when, uh, the, when you leave the fixed point, and it has very naturally uh, a small value. So, <clears throat> at some moment, the behavior near the fixed point ends. You make a crossover, uh, you enter faster running of the coupling, and uh, this really sets the end of inflection. Now, what happens after? You have heating. I will not go into details. There are several papers on that by different authors now how to compute that. After that, you enter a new type of scaling solution. Now, again, with a Hubble parameter proportional to mu, and if you're chi increasing exponentially, so all masses increase exponentially, but of course, the scale on which they increase exponentially is the slow scale mu. So it's on a time scale of 10 to the 10 years that they increase exponentially. But the different scaling solution it holds both for matter and radiation domination. You realize again an extremely simple solution. And uh, you can compute what are these constants for radiation domination. You find the universe shrinks. Uh, you can compute it uh, also for matter domination. Uh, then you have to take into account that the particle masses are all proportional to chi. So you will get now an additional term to proportional to the trace of the energy momentum tensor from this chi dependence of the mass. You insert it again into the uh, equations, you find you get a different uh, solution again, the sitter space uh, with exponential increase, uh, and the universe shrinks again. And you can actually compute for both of these solutions how much is their dark energy, and you find this really realizes this old scaling or tracker or attractor solutions where dark energy decreases proportional to the dominant energy density can compute how much there is early dark energy, and this is directly given by this function p that goes to zero at last at late time. Observation by now requires that at the time of CMB with the emission b is smaller than 0 0.02. <coughs> so that's all fine, but that's of course a scaling solution, and if you want to have realistic cosmology, so in the sense that was the status already in 87, 88 with this scaling solution. Now for realistic, it has a nice feature. It explains why dark energy is of the same order of magnitude as dark matter. It also tells you the cosmology effective cosmological constant really goes to zero because there is no other uh, energy, there is no other uh, potential energy than given by the scalar potential. You may not add actually a constant that would not change anything. And it really tells you that uh, the observable cosmological constant goes to zero asymptotically simply because the Planck mass increases. And the only thing that you can observe is ratio cosmological constant divided <coughs> by the fourth power of the Planck mass, and that goes to zero. That is why in the Einstein frame, you will find an exponential potential that goes not to a constant, but to zero. But still, a scaling solution is not good enough. It explains why we have dark energy of the same order as dark matter, but we cannot explain why at present we have more dark energy than dark matter. And in the past, uh, from nuclear synthesis and so on, we know that we have substantially <coughs> less dark energy than radiation. So you need uh, something that stops the scaling evolution of the scalar field, and this is actually done by the second stop of the crossover. Uh, this is in the beyond standard model sector. Again, these two scales are logarithmically separated, so just as in QCD, they can be you know, by different by orders of magnitude as the, let's say, the ratio of lambda QCD or the unification scale. And the second uh, crossover, since it's in the beyond standard model sector, will be visible first in the neutrino sector. Since neutrinos by the seesaw mechanism involve the beyond standard model sector, uh, having neutrino mass or triplet, whatever you want. And uh, so let's explore now what happens if the particle masses for all standard model particles except the neutrino 
scale proportion to chi, but if you have a second call crossover that shows up first in the neutrino sector, then the neutrino mass will increase with a different rate and actually faster than uh, the electron mass. So the neutrino mass divided by the electron mass will increase in the present epoch. But this has very simple consequences. It stops the scaling solution. You find a new solution uh, and you can compute what is the present dark energy and you can actually relate it to the neutrino mass. Right? This question in this equation, you have of course quantities like neutrino density and so on that come from <coughs> decoupling in the early universe. So it's not such a simple relation, but if you do everything numerically, you find that the force root of the dark energy density should be 1.27 times 10 to the power minus 3 electron volt times this parameter order of order 1 gamma which tells you how strongly the neutrino mass increases times the neutrino mass in electron volt. You see that's a quantity of order unity and the whole thing should be 2. It's a pretty good prediction. I mean I do not know many predictions that really give you a value for the present dark energy density uh, of course, it's only a relation, it's only a correlation if you want, but since we know the order of magnitude of the neutrino masses, this works really pretty well. You can also compute the Crescent equation of state for this model. It's pretty close to minus one. It's a little correction, which is unfortunately pretty tiny if neutrino masses are much below one electron volt. So, for the last two minutes or so, can we detect it? Well, there are some interesting consequences. One of them is that these neutrinos feel a force that is an attractive force that is much stronger than gravity, a factor 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 times stronger than gravity. You have to simulate what happens, they become nonlinear, they form big lumps. Actually, since the neutrino mass oscillates, the lumps form and dissolve. Uh, <coughs> if you really compute it, then what is the effect? On the overall cosmology, it's pretty small. You barely can distinguish here the lambda CDM cosmology from uh, the cosmology I'm proposing to you. There are small differences, but you may be able to see the neutrino lumps. So let me just uh, finish with it and ask, uh, is it compatible with observation? Can you test it? Well, this very simple model has a few predictions. There's a spectral index. It has the tensor ratio. Uh, it has the presence of a small fraction of dark energy. I really urge observers to look at this early dark energy. It's much more interesting than a small deviation of W from minus 1. Uh, that, is a, that would be really a, a clear sign, dynamical dark energy, escaping solution, all that is in this early dark energy. <coughs> and you may detect large neutrino lumps. You may detect it by some upscale anisotropies in the uh, in the CMB background or so on, if we are sitting in one of these huge lumps, because these, huge, these lumps of the neutrinos, they can be, you know, as big as 100 megaparsec or something like that. Really huge objects. They are not dominant, because there are also few neutrinos in the uh, universe, but they are visible by their gravitational potentials, and we may be able to detect them. And just to finish, before my chairman gets impatient, uh, all these nice things you can, of course, simply map it to a more standard frame by a wild transformation, then you have a, plank, a constant Planck mass, constant particle masses, the exponential goes to zero, exponential, the, the potential goes to zero exponentially, very nice the peasant potential, actually the original one, and the whole details uh, where you see inflation and so on are now given in this kinetial, and this kinetial is directly related to this constant B. So, that's it. Uh, here you have a standard picture with a big bang. Uh, the transformation is singular at the ultraviolet fixed point, which explains <laughs> the existence of a singularity in the standard Einstein picture. And I will conclude with a few very simple statements. Uh, in this model, the crossover in quantum gravity that is not yet shown, but there are many folks are working actively to see that. This crossover in quantum gravity is reflected in the crossover in cosmology. It, this makes quantum gravity actually testable by cosmology.
cosmology, and not only in the very early universe, but also in the late universe through its effect on dark energy. The scale of field, if you want, it is uh, you know, a, a, a crucial outcome of these ideas of uh, uh, quantum gravity, just like, let's say, uh, electromagnetic radiation comes from a unification of electricity and uh, magnetism. And you can test the scale of field really also in the late universe by testing the properties of uh, dark energy. The simple cosmogram model explains all cosmological epochs. Uh, you have just the same quadratic potential both for inflation and for uh, early dark, uh, and for the late dark energy. And this function B does not change by many orders of magnitude. Uh, it remains order one everywhere, so there is no particular tuning. And the simple model that has no more three parameters uh, than lambda CDM is so far compatible with all observation tests, and I think I will stop here to leave some time for questions. Conservation, uh, well, uh, energy con uh, depends how you, how you do it. I mean, there is, of course, a, you can define an energy to a momentum tensor for the right hand side of, uh, of, uh, of R mu nu minus one half and of G mu nu. Uh, that one is conserved, but since you have a chi squared in front of it, uh, I mean, things are a bit more complicated. So you have the standard energy momentum tensor that is conserved in, uh, uh, in the Einstein frame. You have, if you rewrite your equations as uh, you know, Einstein tensor equal to uh, a constant times the, uh, the energy momentum tensor, this energy momentum tensor would of course be con uh, conserved as required by the Bianchi identities. But uh, if you just have, uh, you know, the field equations are a bit more complicated when you're, when you're, uh, when you're instead of a Planck mass, you have a, uh, a scale of field uh, multiplying it, and you just have to derive the proper field equations and solve them. Since you have diffeomorphism symmetry uh, realized, there's never ever anything going wrong. Good. Uh, and of course, agree with your uh, statement that uh, the idea that one can describe cosmology either in the Einstein frames or in the Jordan frame, uh, but uh, I have difficulty to understand why your new ultraviolet fixed point doesn't it isn't the singularity exact, exactly because of the question which already uh, mentioned. If you look, for example, at the equation of multiple particles, you know they are no longer two lessons, they contact back the one over time, right? Mm -hmm. In the additional force which you get from the scalar field, and this, this additional force for the geodesic deviation equation, for example, diverges. And it's important to take all that properly into account, otherwise you will not get a proper mapping between the Einstein frame and uh, the freeze frame. Well, I had a lot of discussion with uh, Steinhardt and Linde on that at some moment. Uh, is the universe really eternal? Uh, the way that brought me to this firm, firm opinion that the universe is eternal was first the discovery that you can have a picture where everything is just flat space uh, in the infinite past. Uh, then, of course, uh, proper time and so on is infinite and everything. So, But once you have one picture where everything is obviously singularity free, you ask where does the singularity in the other pictures come from? Uh, where does, for example, the finite proper time in the standard picture of inflation come from? And the answer is a relatively simple one. First of all, proper time is not a scale invariant quantity uh, because it has dimension. 
you can define a scale invariant quantity that is proper time divided by particle mass. Now this is a see that this is a quantity that is the same in all frames. Huh? But now you see already the problem when the particle mass goes to zero, then proper time uh, becomes uh, a bad measure. Uh, simply because your uh, inverse particle mass goes to zero, uh, goes to infinity, so your time intervals will, in this picture, go to zero. And this is exactly the problem, uh, the point where, uh, which is this, the origin of the singularity in the standard in the standard Big Bang picture. Because if you look for any massive particle, but its is, but its momentum is doing when you go close to the Big Bang, the momentum is increasing to infinity. And that's nothing else than telling, again, the physical particle masses are going to zero. Huh? Because it's particle mass divided by momentum that is measurable. So you really have a situation at the Big Bang, even, you know, physical, even in the standard picture, where physical particle masses go to zero. And then, of course, you should not use proper time. It's as simple as that. Even not proper time divided by particle mass, uh, multiplied by particle mass is not a good measure. And you have to think again, what are really good measures that are independent of the frame, physical measures. And one of the simple ones is just, you count how often a wave function crosses zero. <coughs> that's a discrete number, that's the same in all frames. And this counting tells you, you can now compute that in the Einstein frame, you can compute it in any frame. And the number of ticks really goes to infinity when time goes to infinity. So that just confirms that the singularity in the standard Big Bang, Big Bang picture is what I call the field singularity. Now you have a physical situation, the particle mass is called to zero. Now in the Einstein frame, by force, you want your particle masses to be constant. And the transformation has a singularity at this infrared fixed point, and that is why you get all the singularities in the Einstein frame. But it's just because you force a theory that has the physical property that particle masses go to zero, you force it, you force it into a frame where particle masses are constant, and that's where the problems come from. And I've really calculated now all these invariant quantities in both frames, it's all consistent, and uh, the answer is really it ticks an infinite number of times, the clocks tick an infinite number of times when you go to the infinite pass. One last question, Chris. Um, what Very nice question uh, that I'm posing myself since a long time. Can you repeat? Uh, what happens to black holes? Because once you get rid of the Big Bang singularity, it's pretty obvious that it would be nice to get also rid of the black hole singularity. Uh, not of the coordinate singularity, but of the one in the center. And uh, so my suspicion is actually that since this singularity is also only a field singularity, not field singularities are those that come by singular choice of fields. But I cannot prove it yet. And the reason what you need in order to prove it, you first need to find the stable solution of black holes coupled to a scalar field. And the solutions I found so far are unstable ones, sir, but there must be a stable one, of course. Sir. And I've not yet found a stable one. Once you have the stable solution, you can then look for field transformations in order to get rid of the singularity. But this is for the moment an unanswered question, unfortunately. My guess is it will go away as well. So this is what they set up. There was a question in the back. Yeah. I was just wondering, me? I was just wondering if you've got this nice cartoon of um, the expansion history of the universe. Where it gets it's the expansion? The expansion history of the universe. Yes. So it gets bigger and then smaller, and it looks as though that's around the time of the cosmic microwave back. <coughs> well, you know, the, there are two changes, two qualitative changes, to, and these correspond to the two possible ones. Mm -hmm. The first qualitative change is at the end of inflation. The second uh, crossover is actually more or less today. It starts at redshift 5. Uh, it's okay. not uh, CMB emission. Uh, so during C emission, CMB emission is still shrinking. It just Starts, uh, changes qualitatively okay. so now. So, so then uh, another prediction of this theory then is that we see quite different angular diameter distances at redshift 5. Is that right? 
No. 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 <laughs> I mean, you know, every single quantity that you compute, any observable quantities, must be the same in the Einstein frame and in the freeze frame. And the Einstein frame, we just have the standard picture except for 1% or so of early dark energy. So all measurable quantities are strictly the same. It's not a new theory of the universe, it's just a new picture of one and the same uh, thing. And the only thing that is new are the effects of this physical scale of field. Uh, <laughs> energy, neutrino lumps and so on. But you can describe them in both the Einstein frame or the free frame. And you can never distinguish by any experiment between these two frames. You can never settle the question if the universe is shrinking or expanding because it's an ill-posed question. The only thing you can measure is, is the radius between uh, the distance between galaxies divided by the atom mass. Is this expanding, is this increasing or decreasing? And this you can measure and it is increasing. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.
Actually, we are organizing the uh, right to sample workshops every year. So we have the skilled supporting the staff. They will uh, help, help you for your visa application and the other required arrangements. So this is a uh, access to our issued uh, Kyoto City. Um, probably you will arrive in the two uh, major international uh, airport. It's a uh, Kansai Airport or Narita International Airport. If you arrive in Kansai International Airport, just take the uh, airport express Haruka, then it will bring you to the Kyoto Station directly. It uh, takes about one and a half hours. If you arrive in the Narita, then just take the also uh, Narita Express, just JR line. Then it brings you to the Tokyo main station. Then you can change the train to the uh, Super Express Shinkansen. After two hours, you, you will arrive in Kyoto. So it's easy to access uh, the, from Kyoto to the other major city like Kobe, Osaka, Nagoya, Tokyo. So probably uh, before after this conference, you can easily arrange your uh, seminar, uh, research seminar or type of things. So this is the weather. Now uh, planned schedule is December, but December is not so very cold. So temperature is uh, similar to the spring March. So okay, and uh, probably. You know that Kyoto is a very famous tourist uh, place. So we have a lot of uh, uh, temple and shrine, and these things. Uh, every uh, we actually Japan has a more clear season. So in every season, they have a different place. So just enjoy it. Also, we have the several other things like uh, culture and food. You can enjoy several uh, Japanese traditional things. So, hope to see you again at Kyoto next year.